I think predominantly ESG as a term has been weaponized hmm. um, by the right and that there's been a lot of stories and a lot of uh, uncovering research around the quality of that data, where that data is coming from, and frankly, how that data should be used. And from our clients' perspectives, that they're corporate decision-making tools. So we use SEE because it's an investor's perspective first. Stakeholders, environment, ethos are the way you think about those things. So that's like a, a screen for you? It's actually a series of screens. So its purpose is not that different than you've seen ESG be used before. Uh, the difference is, is that rather than being a business decision tool for companies to avoid ESG risks, ours is a process to uncover and label those companies so they can be aligned with investors' values. What do we know so far about whether, you know, looking at SEE contributes to positive returns? Because I know some complaints with some of those ESG funds, um, at least in the ETF space, was that they actually looked just like the S&P 500 and so performed you know, just like the benchmark. And there wasn't much outperformance there. So that's a great point, Emily. ESG versus SEE is a tool in the toolkit to be used. Uh, neither one of those two things used in isolation will make up for bad portfolio management. You still have to be thoughtful. You're using it as a tool to narrow a list. You still have to be responsive. You still want to pick companies that are going to do well going into a falling rate environment. Just because it does well in ESG or SEE metrics doesn't mean you want to own it in all cycles. It's still up to be good at stock selection. Mm -hmm. So we have the jobs report coming up tomorrow. We have a Fed meeting in two weeks, not one. I thought it was next week. Time um, flies, though, when you're having fun. Flies. So it might feel like one week. <laughs> what are you watching right now as the biggest risk in markets? Is it further economic weakening? Is it actually data that comes in too hot? and prompts the Fed to maybe uh, reverse these plans for a more dovish end of the year? So that's a great question. I think that there, are, I would put them in the following order. What happens tonight with Broadcom will be a tremendous mm. indication of how the market trades tomorrow up until that release. Uh, 831, I think, is the time that that thing drops. Uh, and you'll be able to tell right away whether or not it's going to be a 25 basis point or 50 basis point reduction. My view huh, is that a 25 okay. basis point reduction is best case scenario. 50 basis points to me is scary because it'll mean that they're seeing something that the broader economy hasn't necessarily priced in yet. Mm -hmm. And it'll make me a little more nervous about getting a little bit closer to the potential for recession. So Jason, 25 if, basis points. Yeah. That, sorry, Tim, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say if you so w what's the number that you see to know that it's going to be 25 basis points? I think if we come in at or around where the non-farm payroll number is expected, uh, we should be fine. It's it's going to be a really big surprise one way or the other, or specifically, you know, to the downside that's going to cause them to to do that 50 basis point drop. Right. Right now, we are at least the Bloomberg economists are expecting an addition of 165, which would be an uptick from the 114 added. What if we got an upside surprise, Jason? Uh, well, so that's actually not something the market's pricing in uh, into the September cut. Uh, I think that if you saw an upside surprise, you might see a change in the beige book language as it relates to, but I still think you're going to get a 25 basis point cut. I think Chairman Powell's remarks mm. at the, and Jackson Hole made it that there's not wiggle room there. Like they're really going to, something really dramatic would have to happen. And I just don't see it in the cards. Mm. I want to zoom out a little bit because we had a very volatile August. We really had... I think a moment in the beginning of August where people thought that the market had taken a turn and there was no going back, stocks dropped and they were not going to rebound. And then we had a pretty significant rebound. Now that we're headed into September, I feel like, Tim, we've been asking people, what do you expect? Do you expect the seasonality to take over? Do yeah. you see stocks drop in September? Or are you more optimistic? How are you feeling about the rest of the year in light of the fact that we did have you know, such a significant market move last month. So I think we're going to continue to see the markets be very choppy between now and the end of the year, even in a lowering interest rate environment. Uh, right now, everybody's trade, trading on news, right? I mean, you saw it with just NVIDIA and investors overreacting earlier in the week to the DOJ subpoena. They had a great quarter. Numbers were good. Guidance was good. And all of a sudden, the stock fell off, you know, a cliff. My opinion is that we should be really looking at, you know, diversifying out of some of the Magnificent Seven because they've had such tremendous run up 
and looking at some of the other sectors 